Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is week three of the three-week financial literacy series sponsored by the Athenaeum and the FDIC. Um, my name is Abby De Molina. I am giving this class based on my understanding of financial literacy, being a part of the Economic Empowerment Forum Opportunity Council, and I work as a finance manager at Santander Bank. So um, great to have you all here. Thank you for coming. And this week, we're going to focus on the past two, mod or not modules, but each week we focus on one targeted area. So the first week was helping people understand the basics in banking. The second week was talking a lot about credit. And then this, this week, we're going to be talking a lot about housing and understanding all the process of either renting or buying a house. And then I was going to do an overview on managing debt at the end. But um, if you guys want to focus on anything, I want this to be interactive, feel free to jump in and ask questions. You can, you know, unmute yourself and ask, or if you want to put it in the chat, that's also an option. So whatever you prefer, just feel free to ask me any questions or jump in as you see fit. So, um, as I said, this is week three. Thank you for everyone who's come to the prior weeks. And if you've missed them, obviously they're recorded and they'll be on the YouTube page. So you can check them out at any time. And as I mentioned this week, we have four different modules. So if you're following along the FDIC curriculum, it's modules 12, 13, and 14. And I also said we're going to um, finish with the last module, which is on managing debt. I think, yeah. So those are the ones we're going to focus on. So the, to start off, we're going to talk about making housing decisions. And so um, this is just going to be basics. And again, it might be a refresher for you guys, but it's really helpful just to understand all these different pieces. But um, what are your options? Obviously, you can rent, you can rent a room, an apartment, or a home, you can rent an entire apartment, you can rent a house, um, you can rent some sort of privately owned subsidized housing, or you could rent uh, public housing, and there are a bunch of different government programs if you're doing that. And then for buying, you can obviously buy a single family home, a module home, a townhouse, a condo, you could live in a cooperative, you could live in a manufactured mobile home. Um, so these are just some of the options that um, that are available to you. There's no right or wrong answer. There are attractive options for both. The important thing is uh, what can I afford? And realistically, an affordable payment for housing is one that you can reliably make each month. And the term affordable, I think, as people know, living here in Nantucket, it's very relative. Really, the only one who can decide what's affordable for you is you. Um, landlords and mortgage lenders, they can have their opinions and their thoughts, but ultimately they're not the ones who decide. And so on the right hand side, I have this graphic that shows there's a lot of different things that go into um, what your options are and what you can afford, your age, the age of the, the property, the condition, the amenities, accessibility, the location, neighborhood, if you have to do any improvements to it, um, if you're borrowing money, what the interest rates are, and then what the market is. These are a bunch of the things that help influence what you, what's available and what you can get. So when talking about what I can, what you can afford, there are a bunch of different methods of, um, of understanding like how you can decide. So the first one is you take your annual gross income and income and you multiply it times three for, and this is usually when you're talking about looking for a house to buy. It's not really helpful with a monthly payment, but in this sense, you could say, if I made $100,000 a year, my spouse also makes $100,000 a year, then we add that together, it's 200,000 times three. Realistically, you could buy a house that would be around 600,000. And it's just, it's just an estimate. It's just one of the ways that people can um, use to kind of gauge what might be available to them. In the, the second method, you take your monthly gross income and you multiply it times 
30% to get an estimate of what monthly housing costs could be. And monthly housing costs could be a bunch of different things that could include rent or mortgage, obviously insurance, utilities, maintenance and repair. And again, this is just an estimate. So this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it could help you. So again, if you know that your monthly gross income, I'm just using round numbers here to make it easy, is $6,000, then you multiply that times 30%. And that's how you, you come up with the idea that, okay, my housing costs could be 1800 a month. And, and again, it's just an estimate, but it, it could be a way for you to understand that maybe if you're thinking that's my gross income, I don't really want to spend more than 2000 a month. That might be how you, you get to that number because you could say, okay, rent might be 1500 utilities might be 100 insurance might be another hundred, et cetera, et cetera. And then, Method three is more gauged toward when we talked about in previous modules, but if you have a spending and savings plan, what your total net income is minus all of your non-housing expenses gives you a number that could be what's left for housing. And so you might say your net income is 3000 a month, your non-housing expenses are 1000 so then again, what might be left for housing is 2000 and again, all of these are just estimates. It's just ways to help you kind of start thinking about it and get it an idea because sometimes people have no idea and you start here and then you can really refine it and get a lot closer to what you think makes the most sense. So what's next if I decide to rent? Important thing is if you are deciding to rent, make sure that you understand there are a lot of ways to protect yourself as a renter, including reading and understanding your rental agreement or lease, getting rental insurance, and then knowing your rights and responsibilities. In the state of Massachusetts, it's also important to note that um, we have pretty strong housing laws here. So you do have a lot of rights as a tenant. And if you're not ever sure, if you have any questions, there's a state housing agency, um, it's called CHAPA. There are different resources and, and I list them here some of the federal ones, but you can also go through the state to make sure you understand what your rights are. So when renting, what are the steps to doing it? The first thing is figuring out where you want to live. So again, uh, there's a lot of different aspects and factors that might go into it. Safety and security, if there's public transportation, your distance to work, childcare, medical service, any other services and supportive people that might be family and friends. Um, quality of schools, if you have children, also access to parks and playgrounds. If there are people, if you happen to be a person with disabilities or have somebody in your family, accessibility to features that can help people with disabilities. And then anything else that might be important to you. Um, living here in Nantucket, some people might say they wanna live close to a certain park, or um, I know I have a dog, so living close to a place where I can take my dog for walks is important to me. There are all sorts of different things. And then um, the second step is figuring out what kind of place you want to rent. If, do you, do you want to rent a whole home? Do you want to rent an apartment? Do you just want to rent a room? Those are some of the things you have to keep in mind. And then kind of hand in hand with that is figuring out what you can afford. If you want to rent a house, but you really can only afford to rent a room, then you're probably going to have a tough time finding a house in your budget. Not impossible, but it might be difficult. Um, other other steps that you need to take is understanding your credit and how it might affect what you can rent. Um, as I mentioned in the previous module, when we talked about credit, landlords likely do look at your credit re reports and um, will get a copy. What you should do to proactively kind of protect yourself and make sure there's no surprises is get a copy of your credit report. As we talked about, annualcreditreport.com, or you can call this phone number and get it. Um, if you have low credit scores or there's negative information on your credit report, it doesn't mean you can't rent. It just might be harder. You might have to spend more time looking for an apartment. You might have fewer choices. You might have to pay a larger deposit. You might have to get a letter of guarantee or someone to co-sign. You might have to find room, roommates or you might have to reconsider your decision to rent. When looking to rent, make sure you, you 
do this yourself. You don't really need to pay someone. You can, but a lot of times it might take away from what you could afford to rent. So you can search the internet, you can look in newspaper online, there's tons of places to go. You can use an agent. And then you can also explore any other local resources to help you find rentals. Especially here in Nantucket, I think there's a really strong um, Facebook community, a lot of word of mouth. Those might be good options for you if you're looking for a place is asking around, asking through your work, asking through your friends, people you know, and you might be able to find stuff that might not be listed officially. So once you know, once you know that like where you're thinking about, make sure you get your first month's rent and your deposits together. You might have to pay for some rent rent before you move in. You might have to pay in a security deposit. It all depends. Um, it'll vary. It should be returned to you if you met the terms of the lease. There might be other fees you have to pay up front, and you might have to prove you purchase renters insurance. But um, the next step is also making sure you read and understand your lease and rental agreement. And it's agreement that's between you and the landlord or property owner and it's very important. Going back to renter's insurance, why that's important is it provides you financial recovery from losses. There are um, hazards and disasters called named perils. There might be costs and replacement costs. There's limited or no coverage for some items, but it might help you, um, let's say, you had a laptop and it got broken and got stolen. If you have renter's insurance and you can prove it was in your apartment, that is an example of something that would be covered. Um, some places, especially if you're going through like um, an organized like apartment building somewhere like that, you might be required to purchase it. It's pretty widely available. The costs vary, so you have to shop around. Sometimes places have certain insurance companies you have to use, but you should look and see. It's usually not incredibly expensive, so um, it's worth taking a look. And it will, at the very least, provide you financial protection from claims or of injury. And, um, and the reason why is, can you afford to replace your personal property if there's something you might have received as a gift, um, something that is expensive, it's definitely worth insuring it just because you know, it wouldn't be smart for you to just leave yourself open the liability. And then another thing to consider is if someone was visiting you and they got injured, would you be afford to pay um, the expenses resulting from the injury? Chances are probably not. So again, it's just smart to have it just in case. And um, as a renter, you're right. There's something called the Fair Housing Act. It, prohibits housing related discrimination based on all of these things, race, color, origin, religion, sex, disability, if you have children. And also any housing has to meet local health and safety codes. And if you didn't know what they were, if you happen to be on Nantucket you, or anywhere you are, you can contact the local organization and, and they should be able to provide you a copy of what that code is. There are um, these things known as reasonable modifications. If um, a resident with a disability, um, they have the can and make, they can make and pay for reasonable modifications. They're allowed structural modification to enjoy the full enjoyment of the housing. And the examples are um, replacing certain types of flooring. You might have to widen a doorway if someone has a wheelchair, lowering of kitchen cabinets. These things are, um, modifications that can be done and should be done. And again, um, reasonable accommodations must be done by the provider. And this is an example of if you are handicapped or have a disability and you might have to have like reserved parking near the entrance, things like that. And um, again, this is to protect people with disabilities so they have the equip equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling or unit of co or common space. And um, if you're not sure, always get help. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different resources. There's the federal HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, your local housing authority, 
there might be a HUD approved housing counseling agency, there might be a, uh, a housing or real estate attorney, legal aid, and just here to no note that ways to protect yourself as a renter include reading and understanding your rental agreement or lease, getting insurance, and then just making sure in general that you're informed and you know your rights and responsibilities as a renter. So that's renting. The next module is, of course, if you decide instead of renting, you want to buy a home. So getting ready to own your home is complicated and it's a process. So what you should again do similar to renting is make sure you understand at step one that you're actually ready to do it and figuring out what, you're, what you can afford. So one of the reasons to buy a home is to get equity, which means you get the value of the house minus what you owe in the home. It can increase, stay the same or decrease. Generally over time, the equity increases as you continue to pay down your mortgage, the amount of value that you can get out of your home increases. So similar to renting, there are a bunch of different steps. Step one is getting ready, figuring out how much you can afford, checking your credit history, deciding if you're ready. Two, step two is figuring out your financing. You can go get pre-qualified or pre-approved. You can learn about mortgages and other financing options. You can shop around, talk to different banks, different organizations to see what are the rates they're offering, what are the different things. Step three is shopping for your actual home, putting together your team, finding a home that fits what you need with what you can afford. Step four is obviously buying your home, making an offer, negotiating, getting a home, construction and closing. And then step five is maintaining your home. So I know these are a lot of steps. I'm going to go in depth into each of them. But um, let me stop. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll keep going. So when figuring out how much you can afford, again, only you can really decide you should take close, a close look at your uh, spending and saving plan. Can you increase your income? Can you decrease your expenses? Anything you can eliminate? You should familiarize yourself with a lot of the terminology for um, mortgages, principal, interest, taxes, insurance. You should look at your total net monthly income minus your non-housing expenses as we talked about that'll give you an idea of what's left for housing. Any other additional one-time costs or ongoing costs? And another tool that you can use is you can do your monthly debt payments divided by your total monthly gross income. And this can help you understand how much of your monthly gross income before taxes goes to covering your monthly debt. So again, these tools are just helpful in, in you understanding what, um, how much money you would have available. And you might have other expenses besides debt. Clearly the higher your debt to income ratio, the less, less money you have to, to cover these expenses. So when financing a um, home purchase, you need to know your loan, understanding your financing options for buying a home and shopping around. Again, should educate yourself about mortgages. I talked about a couple of these important terms. A mortgage is a loan to buy a home. The principal is the amount of money you borrow. In costs, there are a lot of different things that could be in there. It could be interest, points, fees, there are other charges. And then understand your annual percentage rate is the overall cost of the loan on an annual basis. And on the right-hand side, this little table, I just thought this is helpful to understand Depending on the type of housing, the loan might be called something slightly different. So manufactured housing, such as a mobile home or rented land, can be called a personal or chattel loan. If you happen to get a unit in a co-op, it could be called a co-op loan or a co-op share loan. And then if you're buying a house, a condo or a townhouse, that's usually called a general um, mortgage. And um, here's an example of the down payment and what that means. So in this example, if you're gonna pay a portion of your home's price in cash, you're gonna get a house for 160,000 with an $8,000 down payment, it means you're gonna borrow 152,000. 
So the 5% down payment is um, 8%. So you, the higher the down payment, usually it's the less money you have to borrow. I know this example is slightly unrealistic as I'm not sure where you can get a home for 160,000, probably not here, but could be possible. So also important terms, private mortgage insurance, PMI. I'm sure you've heard this kind of thrown around. This is usually required by a lender if your down payment is less than 20%. What it does is it lowers the risk to the lender, but of course it increases your monthly payment because it's like an insurance to them that you're not gonna default on your loan. Other important parts of your mortgage is the loan amount, what type of interest rate, um, the loan term, and then any upfront costs you have to pay at closing. So there are two ways usually to pay for taxes and insurance at closing. You pay them as part of your monthly mortgage payment. They're set in something separate that's called an escrow account. A lot of times this might be required by whoever you're borrowing the money from. If you have the bank, they'll have a set up, they'll set up the escrow account for you and they'll, they'll require it and they'll set it aside. Or another less common option is you pay them directly. With mortgage loans, there are different types. A fixed rate mortgage means the interest rate doesn't change. You pay the same amount each month, unless the caveat is your taxes or insurance and escrow might change. This is a good choice. Like right now, interest rates are really low. And if you plan to keep the mortgage for a long time, if you're say, um, thinking of doing like a 15 or 30 year mortgage, usually fixed rate mortgages are, are a better option. The other option is an adjust, adjustable rate mortgage called an ARM. And initially the interest rate may, may start lower than the fixed rate, but it adjusts on a certain predetermined date or might be tied to a certain kind of in, index. And so this might be a good plan if you only think you're gonna keep it for a short amount of time where you might be able to, to benefit from that, that low kind of teaser rate. And then you can, you can afford paying more in interest if rates increase and you can't refinance with a lower rate. So if for whatever reason you wouldn't be able to, to refinance, this might be an option. Another thing important to know when you're shopping around for mortgages is, um, is getting something called a rate lock. And this is important because mortgage interest rates can change, they can change daily, hourly, they change all the time. And what a rate lock means is that you get that, literally you get that rate locked in for a certain amount of time. And so what, usually if you're trying to um, get pre-approved or pre-qualified, that's when you're here, you'll hear this term about rate lock. And periods can usually, they're typically 30, 45, or 60 days because it'll, it'll be through the amount of time that you're going to be closing. Sometimes it can be longer if you talk to the lender or, um, you know, you might have to change your closing date. They might be willing to work with you on that. Um, something called a balloon payment is it's when a larger than usual one-time payment might happen at the end of the loan term. So you might have lower payments, but then at the end you have to pay kind of the remainder and it might be a much bigger number. With a conventional mortgage, generally you need a pretty good credit history, a regular income, what they call the debt to income ratio within their limit, and then a down payment. Something called a jumbo loan is a mortgage for, it's above a certain amount of money. Depending on the bank, I know some banks, I think it might be over six, uh, 750,000, but it really depends. Each bank might have a slightly different interpretation, but it's for relatively expensive homes or homes in a high cost area. I know that jumbo loans are more common here in Nantucket. And a second mortgage is to usually apply additional financing beyond the first mortgage. And again, some banks might require, like if you have multiple mortgages, you might have to have a certain amount. You might have to have a certain kind of payment. There, there might be different requirements for that. Um, there are some government guaranteed loans. They, they would be sponsored by any of these, these organizations, the FS, 
FHA, Federal Housing Administration, the Department of Agriculture, Veterans Affair, or HUD. There are um, other assistance. There's down payment assistance. There are also um, our closing cost assistance. There are a bunch of first-time home buyer programs. People in certain professions, there might be help for. And then I mentioned this a little bit earlier. There are loan programs and programs that come through the state housing finance agency. And as I mentioned, it's called CHAPA here in Massachusetts. So um, they, you can talk to them and see what they have available. So with how mortgages work, the important thing obviously are these key things, the amount of the loan, the interest rate, what kind, is it fixed or adjustable, the term of the loan, and then the amortization schedule. So if you're talking about the different terms, a 15 year loan will have a higher monthly payment, but you'll pay less interest over the life of the loan. And so you pay it off sooner. The 30 year loan, which is more conventional, it usually has a lower monthly payment, but you pay more more interest over the life of the loan and it takes longer to pay off. And amortization is the amount you pay is amortized or it shows how much money is going towards the principal and how much goes to, towards interest if you have the schedule. So it's just helping you understand every month if you're paying a certain amount of money, like what, what does that mean over time? And it will shift from how much you're paying in principal and how much in interest. And I mentioned this before, pre-qualification is an estimate of how much money you can borrow. It's not an actual approval for a loan. It just might be done based on some basic characteristics. They might ask you about your income, your family situation, some of those things. And then the other piece we mentioned is pre-approval, which is an actual commitment from a lender or bank to, to lend you money under their specific conditions. And so when looking, definitely make sure to shop around. There's tons of website aggregators that can help you. You can go to your local bank if you have a relationship with them. There is a three page form you'll receive after applying for a mortgage. It gives you all the details about the loan and you can get it from several lenders, they're free, but it will really just help you and make sure no matter what, that you ask as many questions. So you're, you're as informed as possible. So when, when getting help and buying your home, make sure that you, you do ask for help, make sure that you talk to people. But if you are gonna hire somebody, make sure you interview them, ask for references and understand what, what they're gonna be doing for you and how much it costs. So an example of one of the most important pieces might be a real estate agent. So of course, make sure you understand, are you hiring them? Are they paid on commission? Like how does that work? And then who else might pay, play a role would be, um, you might need a real estate attorney. So um, that might be somebody else who helps you, but making sure you understand if you have people helping you purchase a home, like what are they doing and what are you getting for that? So when making an offer, um, it's definitely complicated. It's very exciting. It says you want to buy the home. And um, again, your real estate agent or the attorney will write your offer for you. And they'll make sure to talk to you and confirm with you. So you understand if you're making an offer that that's what, um, what it is. So what goes into an offer is, of course, all the info about the house the address, the description, the sale price, how much you're offering to pay, an estimated date for your closing, the amount of money you're offering, how uh, taxes and utilities are gonna be paid for, who pays for what in terms of title insurance, inspections, property surveys. You have to do a walkthrough, um, date the offer expires, contingencies, special requests, and other terms. So when thinking about contingencies, a lot of times if you're buying a property and you're moving from one property, a, a contingency a lot of people put in there is that the offer is contingent on them finding another, like they will sell it to you contingent on them finding another property that they're going to move into. So a lot of times there might be contingencies like that. 
put into an offer. So that's pretty common. So again, make sure you understand what those contingencies are because sometimes people can work with that and sometimes they can't. And that's okay. It's just making sure that um, you know what it is. So once you've made an offer, the seller can of course accept it. They can reject it but make a counter offer or they can just reject it and not make a counter offer. When you have to do the home inspection, it's one of the most important steps, especially when protecting yourself and your investment. It's an in-depth unbiased look at the home. It's done by a home inspector who shouldn't know either party. It's completely unbiased. They'll evaluate the physical condition. So and identify any items that might need repair or replacement. A lot of times that can be worked into the offer or the agreement when buying the house. And then it estimates for you, which is helpful, the useful life of major systems, equipment, structure and finishes. So if your house has a certain kind of heating system, it'll tell you how long they'll last. If uh, say the house needs a new roof in 10 or 15 years, they'll, they'll estimate for you those things so that you can plan for them and that you wouldn't be caught unaware. So when closing, it's the last step, it's when the loan becomes final and the actual funds are distributed and then you officially own the home. So the documents that you get at closing are a closing disclosure, the escrow statement, the promissory note, which tells you how much everything is, your payment option, and then the actual mortgage or um, security information. That being said, if you ever have any trouble, it's important to get help as soon as possible. And there are a lot of different organizations you can work with. You can talk with your bank, your lender. There's a home preservation hotline. The, again, I mentioned the housing, HUD approved housing counseling agency, and then your state housing finance agency. So you should make sure to talk to them as soon as possible because they're all in a position to help you if something goes wrong and it's better to work with them sooner rather than later as they might be able to help you before something would go wrong, say your home would be foreclosed or something like that. And so the next module is similar foreshadowing, talking about disasters for financial preparation and recovery. And so um, preparing financially for disasters is obviously a great idea if you can do it, I know it's easier said than done. It can help you save time, time, money, stress when any disaster strikes if you're financially prepared. Of course, disasters can affect your finances in a lot of different ways. You might need to repair and replace things. You might need to meet immediate needs. There are other, other costs. Um, there can be, I know we talked about in the previous modules, identity theft and scams. There are penalties, missing payments, and then you need access to financial resources. So you just, it's better to be prepared and be ready. And um, there's actually a government website, it's called appropriately enough, ready.gov for general preparation. And it can give you a bunch of tools and tips of um, how you need to be prepared financially. You should get insurance. You should set aside, I know we had talked about an emergency savings fund. You should make sure to keep some cash in a safe place, um, sign up for direct deposit, consider online mobile banking, and then keep financial documents and information in a safe place. So these are some of the, the steps that are advised by this website, ready.gov. So when talking about the insurance, um, why it's important, it's our critical support after disasters I know if anybody's thought of a lot of the um, environmental disasters that have happened, insurance is a really important part, understanding your coverage, understanding what you have and how you can file claims. So you should have the insurance before you need it. Again, you can shop around for the best deals. There are a lot of websites that can help you, um, give you the best deals. Understanding your policies, again, what's covered and what's not covered. Make sure you keep um, records of anything and um, the different types of insurance that can help you, of course, auto insurance, disability, life, renters and homeowners insurance. Those are um, 
really important pieces. And then setting aside money in an emergency savings fund. This question is obviously rhetorical. Why have one just in case you're never going to be upset that you have extra money set aside, but it'll obviously will be more challenging if you don't. Um, when setting up an emergency savings fund, I mean, making sure you're realistic. It is tough, it takes time and commitment and it's a cycle, but it's, it's worth doing. And it's very much an important step to improve your financial health and stability. So um, you can always start small and see where you go. And as part of this fund, you should make sure that you keep some cash. This is just helpful where it might be the only option right after disaster, only because it might be harder for you to get access to electronics. Um, you should keep it in a safe place. Uh, that being said, don't keep a ton of cash. It's obviously easy, easily stolen, um, but you should, Keep it in part of if you have a larger emergency kit, what they call a go bag or a bug out bag, you just might want to keep it as, as part of that. You can always keep it, um, you should definitely keep it waterproof and make sure that it's also, if you can, fireproof. Uh, another option that they, that the government advises is um, signing up for direct deposit. The reason why this is helpful is again, you might not have access directly to a bank or checks, but if you have direct deposit, your money is still gonna go into um, your account. And I know this sounds crazy, but one of my first jobs, I worked for an organization and we had employees who worked for us in Florida. And um, we, at that time, used to send them physical checks, but some people had direct deposit and what happened is this hurricane came through and FedEx couldn't physically bring the checks down to Florida. So the only people who ended up getting paid were the people who happened to have direct deposit. So this is just one example, but for those people, it was definitely a lifeline because they still had access to their money. Whereas the people who were waiting for a physical check still had to keep waiting and there wasn't anything we could do because it wasn't even our company. It was, because FedEx couldn't get in there because they, I think they had to fly. So that's just one reason to think about if you don't have direct deposit, it's available. It's always a good option. Um, similar to that, also having online or mobile banking, similar in that your, your bank may be temporarily unavailable, but if you have online mobile banking, you can still do the things you have to do. You can pay bills, deposit checks, do any transactions through your online browser or your phone. And then of course you can still talk to your bank. And thinking about that, keeping financial documents and information in a safe place. I mentioned this a second ago, when you have hard copy records and or money, have a waterproof bag in the fire resistant box or safe. If you have your go bag, you can keep it in there. You can also, a lot of banks have safety deposit box where you can keep it. They are fire and waterproof. And then what you can also do is even if you have a hard copy, you can scan an email securely, a copy to yourself. So with electronic records, you should make sure to keep them in password protected format. And then you can also have them in a secure offsite data storage service, but you could also put them on some sort of thumb drive. And again, if you have a safe deposit box or you have this waterproof fire resistant space, you can keep a copy of that as well. And um, the government advises the emergency financial first aid kit called FX, which um, everyone, they recommend everybody should have FEMA, the Federal Emergency Agency, they have a checklist and forms that can help you prepare it. And so you can go to the FEMA.gov website and search for IFAC, and then they can give you a, a tip on, tips on what everything that should be in there, what exact documents. If you think about um, important financial documents, it would be tracking of any of your major accounts and any, if you have retirement accounts, anywhere where you might have money stored 
your paycheck, different things like that. Those should all be a part of it. And um, always keep your records updated so you can save time, money, and stress when a disaster strikes because you're ready. So that being said, when you have to recover financially from a disaster, the first thing you should do is make sure you develop a plan. Also keep, keep an eye out for scams. So this is um, something we've talked about a little before with the scam, so I'll, I'll get to that. But in terms of financial recovery, the first thing is assessing property that might be other than a home, assessing and documenting any damage, take pictures, contacting your providers, find a safe place to store any cash and valuables, arrange for other transportation, repair, replace, or borrow technology that might have been damaged. So this might be, um, this could be a car, this could be land, this could be other things. In turn, the other piece, of course, is your home. So continue making housing payments or contact your lender or landlord to find out. Again, assessing and documenting damage, talking to your insurance providers, and also talk to your landlord about damage if you rent. And then talk to a housing counseling agency that is certified by HUD to make sure you understand what your options are. For your income and job, make sure you talk to your employer, talk to your benefit providers. If you lost days of work, make sure you keep track. If um, you have a disability and you have a service air animal and you have assistive technology, make sure you care for them. If you have disability insurance, talk to them. You should look into, there might be public benefits available depending on what, um, what the disaster is. You should contact your life insurance and then contact any schools and financial aid offices. In terms of bills and expenses, unfortunately, you should continue paying your bill, talk to your post office, talk to your banks, any creditors, um, keep records of everything that you spend and access any programs for assistance if they're available. And then in terms of protecting your actual money, again, look at your credit report, talk to your bank, talk to the DMV, and have a safe place to store any important documents, cash, valuables. And then again, talk to the post office. I know this seems a little weird, but the post office is the way that people are going to be able to contact you and so just making sure that everything is up to date with them will help you in the future so that being said make sure you're proactive talk to anybody directly then contact any regulatory agency if you need to if you have a problem file a complaint um, if you need help there are different websites, disasterassistance.gov. FEMA will have disaster recovery centers. They have a website, fema.gov. There might be local um, disaster relief, Red Cross, different things like that. There might be meetings in your area. And um, for the financial piece of the disaster, again, talk to, go to the website, disasterassistance.gov. You could talk to FEMA and um, they have an individual and household program. The Small Business Administration has disaster loans. An example is right now, Small Business Administration is still continuing to do payroll protection, PPP loans. So that's an example of a program that um, is designed to assist with financial recovery. And so you can learn about something like that through SBA.gov. The Department of Agriculture might have loans. And then there might be other loans available through the Department of Housing and Urban Development or um, the Home Preservation Hotline. So these are all just different, different agencies and resources for you to talk to if you ever run into this situation. So I talked about this a little earlier. Make sure you watch out for scams. Unfortunately, not everyone who offers help is legitimate. So be on the lookout, protect yourself, be cautious, and 
and be selective. And what's unfortunate is people will sound like they're helpful, but they're not. So that being said, to avoid scams, make sure you check references, ask to see any per permitting locally or by state. Don't ever pay for anything up front. Keep and get receipts. Don't pay for things that should be fee free. The example is like your credit report, like you shouldn't be paying for that. That is free. Um, make sure you research organizations you don't know. Protect your information. Look at your credit report and then read scam alerts and scams and report scams. A lot of times local police departments talk about scams that are coming out. A lot of the information is available online, so make sure you double check. And after that, adjust your financial figure, picture after the disaster. Take time to understand, it might be a new reality. Review and adjust your spending and saving plan. Make sure you contact everyone, lenders, financial institutions. Again, get your credit report. Never gonna hurt you. It's always available once a year for free. And um, make sure you set new goals and make plans to reach them. And again, things, happen and so just making sure that you understand you make a plan and start small that's the best kind of step one so um so that's all the the housing module this one is just talking about debt and i want to make sure everybody understood this is kind of understanding your debt and making sure you manage it so debt is the money you owe, and then credit is the ability to borrow money. So you use credit to borrow money, which becomes your debt. And so debtors are those who owe the money, and then creditors are those who lend you money, also creditors and lenders. And what you need to know, the basics, what you owe, how much you owe, how much payments are, when they're due, any important facts. So um, this little graphic talks about like why do people get into debt? They might need to purchase assets. There might be things they need. There might be things they want, bills, emergencies. These are all different things. So how it can affect your financial situation? You're going to need your future income to pay your, your debt. So it's obligating your future money to pay things off. And usually you pay interest and fees on your debt until it's paid so it'll it'll impact how soon you can reach a financial goal if you're saving money for say a car or a house your debt is going to affect how soon you can get there so the way it works um if you understand the way it works it can help you make informed decisions so there's a lot of different lingo i tried to put a bunch of terms in here Principal is how much you owe. Interest is the main cost of borrowing the money. The, the annual percentage rate is the total cost of credit on a yearly basis. The term is how long you have to repay the principal and the interest. Fees are additional charges, not to be confused with interest. Make sure you understand there might be fees that you're definitely charged, and then there are fees that you could be charged. So an example of a fee you could be charged is if you happen to be late, they might assess a late fee. So you could avoid the late fee and never have to pay it if you always pay on time. But you might be paid a certain, you might have to change, you might have to pay something called like a transaction fee if you are paying it over the phone, for instance. So just making sure you understand what those fees are is really important. A secured loan, um, this is a bit of a refresher from last week. It's a loan with collateral that the lender can take if the loan is not repaid according to the agreement. And an unsecured loan is the opposite. There's no collateral. An installment loan is when you pay uh, a specific amount of money. When you borrow a certain amount of money, you pay a certain amount every, every period. So um, this would be a loan where you say pay $500 a month every month. Revolving credit, and this is usually with credit cards. The credit agreement allows you to borrow money from time to time up to pre-approved maximum credit line. So this is an example, if you have a credit card that has say a $10,000 credit line, that's revolving credit where you can, you buy things with it and then you pay them off and um, up until 
that amount that would be 10,000. So the minimum payment is usually between one and 5% of the outstanding balance. The important thing is of course, the more you pay, the sooner you pay it off and then you pay less interest. And then um, there is something called prepayment, which is you can prepay, you can repay a loan early. You can do part of it or, a, or the whole thing. Usually it will reduce interest, but it might mean an earlier payoff date. Some places to kind of discourage you from doing that, they might have some sort of prepayment penalty. So just make sure that you're educated on um, what, again, whatever those fees are, if there's any penalties, just understanding what that is before you decide to go and do it. So reducing debt, very important. Um, you should develop a plan to reduce debt and get help. If you need it, there are trained credit counselors who can help you. There are two different strategies. And again, one is not necessarily better than the other. It's just important to understand there is the high cost debt first method where you pay you pay off first the debt that is the highest cost to you. So it would be, say, if you had a student loan and a credit card, but your credit card interest rate is 15%, your student loan is 5%, you would pay off the credit card first. So the advantage is obviously you save money. The disadvantage is it might feel slower because um, it usually just takes longer. So the way you do it is you list all your debt with the highest cost to you, to the lowest, and then you pay the amount due on each of them. And then you make an extra payment to the first debt on the list, the one with the highest. And then after you pay off the first one, you make an extra payment to the next debt on the list and you continue as needed. So you don't not pay any of them. You just pay extra to the highest cost one. And so again, this might, feel slower, but overall you're going to pay less. So the snowball method is you first pay off whatever is the lowest balance. And so this usually makes progress. You feel like you're making progress faster, but you actually might end up paying more. So you do the similar list of your debt, only you pay the lowest balance to highest, and then you just pay what's due, and then you make the extra payment to the first debt on the list, so then you continue to pay off um, all those balances until they're, they're done. So again, there's no right or wrong answer. You might prefer one versus the other. The important thing is that you're consistent and you understand which one you're doing. Um, but it is always good to, to have, to definitely pay as much as you can. If you can pay extra, pay extra. But like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. And um, if you need help, there are tons of nonprofit organizations, and you can go to USA.gov, and they can um, point you to local places if you search for credit counseling. So when looking for help, make sure you choose carefully. I know we talked a little bit about this last week. There are debt settlement companies. They offer to make deals with your creditors. They usually charge a lot of fees and might have part of the process or debt consolidation loans. One loan might be used to pay off multiple debt. Again, understanding that the rates and fees and other costs, just make sure you know what you're getting into and that you're using reputable organizations. But as I said, develop a plan to reduce your debt. And if you need help, you can find a trained credit counselor. So that being said, sometimes there can be non-payment of debt and debt and collection. Definitely don't ignore a debt collector. They're not gonna go away. Make sure any debt that you are asked to pay is valid as soon as possible and get help if you need it. And so the life cycle of debt, if it's current, is you take on debt, you pay it off, and that's it. If it's not current, you take on debt, you make payment, you go into default, you charge off, but then collections might come to you once it's assigned to debt collector, and then you usually end up having to pay more in the end. So not borrowing more than you can afford is very important because this will become a vicious cycle. So if you don't pay your debt on time, um, there's lots of fees, more money and interest. You're gonna be contacted by a debt collector. 
you might lose services or you might have to pay extra to reestablish them. You might lose collateral, of course, it can affect your credit. Um, you might be subject to lawsuits. There are different types of garnishments that can happen in it, including treasury offset for taxes. So those are all things that people don't realize if you don't pay, say you don't pay your taxes, the government doesn't just say, okay, whatever. They'll come after you and then they'll garnish your wages so that you are forced to pay it. So it's always better to pay it up front and on your terms than being forced to pay it when it might be a lot harder for you to do. So um, before you decide to pay, pay any debt, make sure you, under, you know that you actually owe it, that um, the statute of limitations hasn't expired, and that you're de dealing with a legitimate debt collector. Unfortunately, there are unsavory people who do prey on people. And um, so verifying for sure is very important. And then if you do know those things, paying it in full if possible is the best option. But if it's not possible, of course, they will try to work with you. You can set up a payment plan, make it sure, making sure it's something you can afford. You can um, negotiate a lower balance that says paid in full and not settled. Um, debt collectors do have to follow certain rules. They can't use abusive, unfair, deceptive practices. Oh, no. Are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I got disconnected. Oh, no, we can hear you. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, okay. Hold on now. I want to make sure I'm on the right slide. So, um, as I said, debt collectors must make sure that they follow all the rules. They can't do anything ab abusive, unfair, or deceptive. Like, they can't force you to meet at a really inconvenient time or place. They can't call you at work if you tell them not to call. They can't threat you with violence or obscenity. They can't use profane language. And you can report problems with debt collectors. I know that's again, probably easier said than done because you're in what could be viewed as a position of vulnerability, but it's just really important to make sure that um, you understand your rights that, you know, you can't be subject to abuse either. All right, so um, the next piece is student loan debt. So, um, making sure you understand when you have to pay back your student loan, what your options are um, and what happens if you're late with payments. And also, of course, getting a repayment plan with your loan servicer is really important. So student loan debt is, of course, any money owed on student loans. It's usually the biggest debt some people ever have and it's a very stressful topic. So what I mentioned is what happens if you don't repay your loans? Um, you'll end up paying more in fees and interest. Your accounts can be garnished. Uh, you might be unable to get more student aid. So you might have to take one or, one or more semesters off, so interrupt your education. It can affect your credit and it'll also affect your ability to, to borrow money and of course add stress to your life. So, um, there are two types of loans, there are private student loans and then federal loans. Um, the important thing is there are a lot of different repayment options. The grace period, there's a standard repayment plan. Um, usually the grace period is a, a lot of times with federal loans, you don't have to start repaying them until you're done with your education. Um, you can do structured payments that aren't based on income. There are different, there's a graduated repayment plan or extended repayment plan. So there are a lot of different options, so just making sure you understand what kind of loan you have is very important. So, um, as I said, there's the revised pay as you earn plan, repay with an E, pay as you earn plan, which is pay, the income based repayment plan, or the income contingent repayment. Plan. And so when understanding which one of these you have, it just 
you have to talk to your lender and understand like what which plan you're going to be on and how your um, repayments are are determined you can ask for um, forbearance if you need temporary postponement if you need your payments reduced because you might have financial difficulty or um, you can defer them again it'll depend on certain situations in terms of loan forgiveness this is something that i i know has been in the news a lot lately there there's the talk of doing loan forgiveness cancellation or discharge um, this might happen if the school is closed i know as of right now this corona situation it's definitely come up um, there could be a public service loan forgiveness again this is a hot topic i know this has come up earlier this year with the campaign. Um, sometimes teachers can have their loans forgiven or um, if you have some sort of disability, and of course due to death, which is absolutely not the reason you want your loan discharged. Um, when trying to take action to prevent default, make sure you look at are there different payment due dates, are there different what your different options are. And then again, if there are options for any of these forbearance, deferment, or forgiveness, et cetera. One thing to understand is even if you declare bankruptcy, it doesn't automatically discharge your loan. And um, similar to other scams, keep aware, never pay anything up front. Anyone who promises fast loan forgiveness, anyone who promises fast loan forgiveness they're um, usually lying. And even if it has the Department of Education seal, it doesn't mean it's legitimate. So never share your um, federal student aid identification number. It's important to know. And then when it's time to pay back your loans, just make sure you consider all your options. Um, the next piece is managing medical debt. If you can't, if you can't afford to pay it, I mean, this is usually one of the biggest problems for people because sometimes these medical bills can be so large and they're totally unexpected. And um, as I said, the result of paying of not paying when they're due and you don't you don't start out with it when you receive care. Um, but they're unplanned. The costs are not known. It can be really expensive. It's also really confusing if you have insurance, like what happens with that? Um, who pays what, and um, the thing is, it will appear on your credit report 180 days after your first missed payment, and so they can still be referred to collections, but it's usually not done as quickly. So what you should do is make sure if there's a bill and you owe it, you pay it. If you don't owe it, make sure you dispute it. If you do owe it and you can't pay it in full, Definitely try to work with them, negotiate a pay, a lower payment, work on a payment plan, try to settle the debt, and then again, work with these nonprofit credit counseling organizations. I have a question, Abby. Isn't it true, yeah. maybe you're gonna get to this, is um, medical debt, as long as you're paying something, they can't send it to collection? And can they charge yeah. interest? Um, they can charge interest, but they can't send it to collections, and it's much slower, like I said, showing up on your um, credit report. If you don't pay anything, it can still be referred to your collections, but um, it, you're right if you pay something, and so that's why no matter what, you should talk to them to try and pay something. And unlike the student loan debt, you could you you can consider bankruptcy and it might be a way to um, remove it. So it, it's definitely not as likely to, to come and affect your credit because it wouldn't even go on your, your um, credit report for 180 days, which is definitely different than anything else. So you have a lot more leeway with it. And um, there's a lot of protections for consumers with medical debt because it's such a hot topic. But thank you, that's a good question.
So um, the last piece is um, just understanding high high cost debt. Like, what is it? It's it can be the result of small short term loans that have costly fees or high interest rates or both. And um, there are risks and benefits to all products, including high cost debt. Something that's popular is um, payday or pay advance loans. And so this little graphic on the right talks about where you visit a payday lender and um, you can get a loan or you can reborrow. You're given a check that's usually dated 14 to 30 days in the future and gives you, and it's given permission to withdraw from the account. They give the borrower the amount of the loan. And then if the borrower doesn't have the money to cover the, the check, it may be reborrowed just with fees. So um, these are high costs. They can be difficult. Um, the difference, like this one, a car ve vehicle title loan, it's for a small amount of money. The car title is collateral. They're often due in 30 days. It's really expensive. Or a pawn shop, if you go to a pawn, um, whatever you're pawning is a collateral. And then if you ask for a loan against it, it usually is between 25 and 50%. So you might, you can either repay the loan or you get the item. So just make sure you understand these. These can be risky and they're tough because you might already be in a tough financial situation. And then having one of these high cost loans will make it hard to pay back. So just make sure you're very aware of what you're doing if you're using these. Not to say they should never be used. They're just High, high risk, I would say. And um, that was it I had about debt, but are there any other questions? Okay. Sorry, I cut out a couple times, but um, if anyone has any questions, I know Janet's gonna send out a copy of this presentation to everybody who attended. Also, I you do have my email address and um, you guys can always reach out to me with any questions. I know last session we had talked about we might, we're thinking about maybe doing a version of this for young adults in the fall if we're gonna gauge interest, see if people are interested in that. If there is something you guys wanna focus on as well, just please let us know, we're happy to um, kind of work with you to, to talk about whatever you find most interesting or important. So um, please let us know. And then of course, if you have questions, do, do feel free to reach out.